I think that it, it didn't come as a huge shock, but it was more of a test. I hadn't believed it. And then I said, hmm, Dolores was correct <laughs> in this. And it gave me the understanding that our perception of contact is colored by our emotional response to it. If we are fearful, if we have listened to those who have a negative spin on all of this and tell us that we are be ta being taken against our will, that we are being mistreated, abused, um, that kind of thing, then we will be fearful and we will take a more negative view of all of this. And, and it's been di so difficult for the people who are terrified about what's going on. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just bad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want to do. Welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. As always, wonderful to be with you again. Well, I have another delicious lady to introduce you to. I'm sure many of you who are involved in the UFO and uh, ET contact communities know Kathleen Marden. Welcome to the show, Kathleen. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know, I've seen you online quite a bit. But I had Sev talk on the show and she spoke about how wonderful you were with her when she had, she was trying to understand her experiences and um, yes. how patient and gentle and kind. And anyway, she just raved. She couldn't rave enough about you. And I thought, right, there's a sign. Better get Kathleen on the show. <laughs> <laughs> and let's see, you know, I'm sure you've got many, many stories to share with us. And uh, remember to those people listening and watching, please subscribe and like and send your comments and do all that great stuff I always forget to remind you on the show sometimes I do but let me read out Kathleen's extensive bio here you've uh, gosh you've done so much in this field here we go Kathleen Martin resides in Florida and is an authority on UFO and NHI contact now what does NHI stand for contact with non-human intelligence, intelligence. There you go. She has a bachelor degree, a BA in social work and worked as an educator and educational services coordinator. She is a practitioner of regression hypnosis and the quantum healing hypnosis technique and is the director of the Sacred Pathway Center for Hypnosis. Her interest in UFOs and contacts began in 1961. <laughs> That's a while ago, Not when <laughs> her aunt and uncle, Betty and Barney Hill, had a close encounter and a subsequent abduction in New Hampshire, in New Hampshire's White Mountains. A generational experiencer, Kathleen has also been an independent researcher of UFO contact phenomena for more than 30 years. She is an associate of the Mutual UFO Network and a director of the Experiencer Research Team and set up a team of 30 specialists who offer support, non-judgmental listening and referrals to experiences and the Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Encounters, which is free. And you must know my friend Mary Rodwell, of course. Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> you work together at Free because she's a part of Free as well, right? You, yes, she is. You set it up together, did you? No, uh, she and Ray Hernandez were two of the beginning people. Uh, it was a little bit later until I had some time to join the organization. Ray had invited me initially, but uh, I'm, I tend to be very busy. And so finally, uh, I told Ray that I would be willing to join the organization and I'm on the board of directors. Ah, beautiful. So you've written quite a few books. Uh, your first book was Captured, 
which is about the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience, which a lot of people in the UFO communities know about. Science was wrong, which is another book. <laughs> I love the title of that. Mm -hmm. And fact and fiction and flying sources. And with nuclear physicist and scientist, ufologist Stanton T. Friedman. He was, yeah, he, he left his body last year, didn't he? 1934 he did. to, to, to mm -hmm. 2019. And the alien abduction files with Denise Stoner gives an in-depth coverage on two of her major cases and four additional cases that she personally investigated. So is this you personally investigating it or her personally investigating it? I personally investigated every case that I wrote about right, yeah. uh, in the alien abduction files and Denise Stoner uh, gave input into uh, her personal experience, her feelings, her attitude, messages she was given, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. So she was an experiencer. Denise is an yes. experiencer. Mm -hmm. And your fifth book is Extraterrestrial Contact, What to Do When You've Been Abducted. In 2018, Kathleen and Dr. Don C. Now, I don't know how to pronounce his last Don name. Don Derry. Don Derry, there you go, completed a comprehensive study with 516 experiences. Wow. Her 50 page report was published in the MUFON 2018 International Symposium Proceedings and is available upon request. Kathleen has lectured at conferences across the United States and in Canada, Mexico, Brazil, and the UK, has appeared on a video lecture series for experiences in China. Fascinating. She has given on-camera commentary on the Discovery Channel, History Channel, National Geographic, Destination America Science channels, oh gee, and everywhere, and several documentaries. Her website is Kathleen slash Marden.com. Oh, well, I've asked you that question. I've got, what is NHI? <laughs> Non-human intelligence. I love that. So you said to me when you sent me an email, I have an important message to share regarding contact with non-human intelligence. Mm, I wonder what that is. Maybe we'll get into that in a minute. Let's, let's hear your journey. So obviously you were related to Betty and Barney Hill. That's and right. My you, mother was mm -hmm. Betty's sister. And how did all this play out for you as a child? When well, I was, thir I was a teenager. I was right. 13 years old when it happened. And my aunt phoned my mother at my childhood home uh, when they arrived home after having had a very close encounter with an unconventional craft. In fact, it hovered within 100 feet of their vehicle and it followed them for a long period of time. Uh, there was uh, physical evidence, there was circumstantial evidence, there was missing time. And Betty and Barney had been so close to that craft that they feared that they might have been exposed to radioactivity, that they might have been contaminated. And they, Betty called my mother because uh, she, knew that one of our neighbors was a physicist. And so she wanted my mother to speak to our neighbor to ask him what she should do. Right. And so my mother did speak with him. And for some reason, he knew a lot more about this apparently than we did. Wow. Uh, but he said to tell Betty if she had a compass, she should take it out to the car to see how the needle would react. Well, she started on the side of the car, and no, no real fluctuation. Uh, she then went up to, toward the rear of the car, and there she saw shiny spots uh, in a pattern that had not been there the day before. When she placed the compass over them, the needle whirled, indicating a magnetic field was present on the trunk of the vehicle. And it just so happened that that magnetic field was in the location where she and Barney had heard code-like buzzing sounds striking the trunk of their vehicle the night before as the craft hovered above their vehicle and just before, just after Barney 
uh, went speeding down the highway to get away from the craft. Mm -hmm. Now, when they heard those buzzing sounds, the car vibrated and uh, they felt a strong kind of tingling sensation through their bodies. The next thing they knew, they were 35 miles down the highway and they had a little recall of what had happened wow. in the interim, but they couldn't remember everything. They knew that they had observed like a fiery orb sitting on the ground. They recalled encountering a roadblock. They didn't know where or when that occurred. And they were brought back to full consciousness by another series of these buzzing sounds. Mm. You know what amazes me about the whole Betty and Barney Hill thing is that they were a, um, I don't like to call it race because I think we're all one race, the human race, but they were a mixed skin colour couple. <laughs> I don't know yes. what to call it. Yes, you know, and that was, that was that, the, unusual and not accepted in that uh, day. widely. So, so they were already progressive, I would say. Um, they were. They were intelligent. Uh, you know, Betty was a college graduate. Uh, Barney was doing very good things in the civil rights movement, and they had a lot in common uh, together in their social and political points of view. They didn't know anything about UFOs. They, uh, it wasn't a, a topic that they were familiar with yeah. at all, but uh, are interested yeah. in. They were interested in politics yeah. and mm -hmm. doing good things for the people of the state of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So yes, they were progressive. Yes. So they've, they've since left this world, haven't they? They have. Barney, yeah. when he was only 46. Wow, that's young. Uh, very young. He had a massive cerebral hemorrhage in 1969. Mm -hmm. now, the, this happened to them in 61. He was deceased in 69. Betty went on you know, living her life without Barney. And so, did you ever regress her? Did you, you know, did you? With Betty, and she would not let me regress her. Really? But I used the questioning technique with her. All right. Um, and and um, what was revealed? I wanted her to kind of relive the event on the craft with me, mm -hmm. uh, moment by moment as it occurred. And I have to tell you that we got to the point where she was undergoing an examination in the room that she was taken to. And she said, no more. She could not go beyond. She never um, got over that fear that wow. she felt, that she experienced, unfortunately. Well, Kathleen, oh, I know. Look, when I think of them, I completely under, know, tune into, um, get messages that they were a part of the hybrid program and that their souls agreed to it. You know, even though mm -hmm. as humans, they went through terror and fear and not knowing, you know, this forgetfulness. But here they are, this amazingly intelligent, progressive couple. Uh, you know, they've already come from they've already come from intelligence, you know, yes. and um, it's a shame that that didn't sort of come out before they, it's a shame the fear stopped her from going further. Yeah. It is a yeah. shame. And I, and I have to say, it's a shame that when we come here to this planet, uh, we do not hold a memory of I our know. lifetime. You don't have the memory of having agreed to be part of this program. Well, you and don't. so it instills terror, terror in so many people exactly. needlessly. You don't until you do. I mean, you don't until you do. You know, I, one of the first people I had on the show uh, about this subject was uh, Sherry Wilde. Yes. And, um, and, and her experiences, for, you know, she just didn't have any memory of what had happened to her her whole life until she mm. had hypnosis. And then, you know, that terror that just, um, and every time she went into a memory of being abducted, she was inside that terror. And her guide said to her, um, are you 
do this every time. <laughs> I, will, I watched this silly movie the other night. <laughs> My daughter was staying with me and she was hearing people scream and she said, what are you watching, mum? I said, I'm watching a horror movie. She said, you never watch horror movies. Why are you watching it? I said, I don't know. But anyway, it was a silly <laughs> movie about alien abduction and it was with, don't ask me the name of it, but it was with... Um, Miller, anyway, one of my favourite actresses that was in The Fifth Element. And it was a horror movie about abduction, but it was just always focused on the terror. And um, it was made out like it was, it was based on a true story and they had two different footages. They had what was supposedly movie footage and real footage. Turns out the whole movie was fake. There was no oh. real footage. <laughs> but it was just horror, horror, horror. And excuse me, as I was watching it, I just kept thinking about the fear people experience when this unknown phenomena and how much fear is involved. And I kept thinking, if only people understand, they don't have to be so scared, thinking that I was watching some real documentary footage. Turns out it was all fictional. Oh. Uh, so over your time regressing people, what has been some of the stories that have has come out from, from this? Well, I started out as a hypnotherapist, pretty traditional, with a lot of knowledge about contact. Right. And uh, using that traditional kind of hypnosis, I don't know if it, it was anticipation by experiencers or what, but it was more of a challenge because they were fearful uh -huh. um, and that I had to work very hard to help them through what they were going through. Um, maybe stopping, uh, giving them time to uh, work through that emotional part of it, and then coming back on another date, that sort of thing. And I wasn't really happy with that methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought there was a kinder and gentler way of doing this. Mm -hmm. And then I met Dolores Cannon, mm -hmm. who had developed the quantum healing hypnosis technique over a period of 40 years. And it is such a kind and gentle technique. Uh, I can still use my forensic questioning mm -hmm. kind of um, technique that I use that was th the only type of hypnosis that used to be permissible in a court of law in the United States. So if I'm really intent upon uh, getting the real story because this is an investigation and, and more than just uh, assisting someone, then uh, I will use that technique. But people, I have not had one person who has experienced trauma during this uh, quantum healing hypnosis technique, hypnosis. And, and I'm so very, very pleased with it because people seem to be in touch with who they really are. Right. And mm. they perceive of themselves very differently yes. than they used to. And it comes immediately. Yeah. Oh, I know. Wouldn't it be great to have done that on Betty? Oh, it would have. Ha have I you had any have. communication with her since she left her body through a medium or your personally? Mm -hmm. Personally and through mediums who came up to me to give me a message from Betty. And? But uh, personally, uh, when I was uh, writing the book and, and compile, compiling additional information after she had left her body, uh, she came to help me. Uh, I, I went to the White Mountains of New Hampshire to once again travel the entire route that they had taken mm -hmm. through the state of New Hampshire. And uh, I stayed in a hotel up there and decided that it would be a very long day stopping at many places to because I wanted to put a lot of the detail about the scenery and what happened in each spot into the book. Yeah. And I had all of the hypnosis tapes too. So I, and I had by that time committed them to memory. So as my husband and I traveled, well, first of all, I want to say Betty and Barney spoke to me all night long. Really? They were communicating with me. 
Wow. And they were with me as I traveled nice. on that route, yeah. telling me just what I needed to know. Aww. And it was very, very helpful for that to occur. Um, my husband and I that then went on Makes a trip to... Cry. Uh, <laughs> Makes me cry. We to, <laughs> what? I didn't Makes hear me you. cry. Oh. Uh, it makes me cry thinking about them helping you, especially yes. since they were. It was so Thailand. wonderful of them. Yeah. And then um, I went on a trip to Barbados with my husband. And Betty, my husband, and I were walking on the beach together. Of course, I couldn't see her, but I could feel her presence. And she was communicating to me uh, when we were on the beach as well. And I think that she was enjoying it and uh, so was, what, was happy to see me doing what I was doing. What did she say to you when she was communicating with you on the beach? Uh, just that uh, it was uh, pleasurable to see me uh, there in Barbados and, uh, but, and to make sure I didn't spend all of my money because it had to go a long way. <laughs> <laughs> She also gave me that little bit of advice, which she always enjoyed doing. She, <laughs> she'd even tell me the proper way to brush my teeth when we were traveling together. <laughs> so <laughs> that was Aunt Betty. And, uh, you know, and when I would go to the stage to, to speak about her experience, people from the audience would come up to me after and they would tell me that they could see Betty standing right over my shoulder, mm -hmm. uh, which was very interesting. Also, uh, if I would be at a conference, say at the dinner at the conference, uh, and there was a medium at the table, uh, at, she would come up and deliver messages to me from Betty and Barney. And uh, I knew that what one in particular was telling me was absolutely true because she knew information that no one else could possibly know. Let me give you an example. Yeah. Uh, when I was caring for Betty, when she had terminal cancer, uh, she uh, would enjoy having ice cream in the evening. And I knew that she was dying, so I decided to spoil her to death. And so I would give her a choice of any flavors of ice cream that she wanted. And she would always choose every flavor, of course, which was a lot of work for me. But I was just wanting to do something special for her. And the, the medium who was communicating um, to me said that she apologizes for putting me through so much work for and all of those special little um, ice cream treats that I would make for her all at That's once. So funny. Little meals that I would make, giving her That's many so things. That's so funny. But what did she have to say about about the whole abduction thing from her broader perspective, from the other side? Did she did she, you know, illuminate you as to why it happened to her and Barney, what their what their sole contract was? Betty has not spoken to me about that. I can tell you though that two weeks before her death, mm -hmm. um, she spoke and what she stated was that in two weeks she would be able to be back on the craft again and she seemed happy about that what barney said to me from beyond the grave is that he felt that this was a punishment to him for leaving his sons in philadelphia and moving to New Hampshire with Betty. What was the punishment? That the abduction itself, the experience, the, that he was, the reason that he was taken, maybe, I don't know, maybe he was speaking of the cerebral hemorrhage too, but he felt that it was punishment being needed out to him. Unfortunately, That's it's really sad thing. that he That's has that impression. Thing. Yeah, yeah. So did that message come to you directly or through a medium? Directly. Directly. Yes. Hmm, interesting. Maybe you thought the hemorrhage was a punishment. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what, why was he being punished? Because he left his son somewhere? He, uh, he felt that if he spoke publicly about this, right. if this was made public, that punishment could be meted out to him by these non-human entities. That was always a fear that he had. And this is why his intent was to keep this confidential. But unfortunately, it was carried to the public as the result of a violation of confidentiality in 1969. And then after that, he and Betty decided that they would permit the first author who ever wrote a book about their experience to write the book. And uh, um, and then Barney began to worry. It, Barney um, was not treated well after this yeah. happened, too. There was a great deal of criticism um, toward him. There was a great deal of skepticism. Uh, Barney was a very brave, intelligent man. Mm-hmm. Yet the disinformants in the United States wanted to paint Barney with a new brush. They wanted to make him to appear to be a frightened man who was completely submissive to Betty and would do or say anything that she asked him to do or say. And nothing could be further from the truth. I knew Betty oh, and Barney very well. Absolutely. I'm getting a message about this that he's cleared it up because I'm kind of asking a million questions <laughs> as you talk. And he says the message that he gave you was about how he felt when he was physical, that he thought that it was a punishment, that he doesn't think that now, but he did that then. That was his, he says that was his great worry that he would be punished um, by what he perceived was the ETs, but, um, but that was his human worry. That's not his worry now. I'm so relieved to hear that. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm really confused and I'm asking a million questions as you're talking. Like, tell me, what, how does that work? And then that message just has come through. Uh, mm-hmm. But he said that he did relay that message to you, but it, it was he, him talking about how he felt when mm-hmm. he was alive. Yes. Um, okay, he says to restate how he felt when he was in his physical body. <laughs> they always correct uh, me when I say things. Yes. <laughs> he says, I'm still alive. I'm just not in my that physical <laughs> Uh, yes which was understandable it caused him a lot of angst uh, and definitely um, um, he's saying it definitely had a lot to do with the illness and his premature death Mm -hmm. yeah caused him a lot of angst unfortunately but you know what I'm thinking as I'm thinking about because I have thought about this before um but not only the whole ET abduction angst, it's the whole racial thing that he would have gone through at that time in history. You know, the sixties and fifties were not a kind, wasn't kind to, especially in America. I don't know. Yeah, especially in America. And yeah. Barney grew up in a segregated society. Yeah. He had served during world war two honorably in the army as a sharpshooter and as a truck driver. And uh, he had excellent character, yeah. uh, according to his army record. Uh-huh. And then he came back into the United States, and here he is considered a second-class citizen in a large section of the United States. Yeah. And, uh, you know, not being permitted to sit at the front of the bus, not being permitted to eat in a restaurant with white people, not being permitted to use the white restroom or to, or to swim with whites. It was horrible. It was just horrible back Crazy. then, the way Crazy. Um, the races were divided. Crazy. You know, I've said this on the show before, but uh, the times, how they are changing. So my daughter is 28 now and probably about, oh, how many years ago? 10, maybe longer. 10 or 12 years ago, a girlfriend of mine died and Mm -hmm. she worked as a life coach in the corporate world. And she worked with this beautiful black man who was just this magnificent life coach in, in they went into corporate world and sort of help people find more kindness and connection. And anyway, they had this um, non-religious ceremony for her death 
and she was with her mother talking about who they wanted to be master of ceremonies, you know, for the, the celebration of life, the funeral. And mm-hmm. she, they had it at the golf club here in a sort of she-she part of Sydney. And um, my friend had suggested this gorgeous man that was her best friend. And her mother had said, oh, no, we can't have a black man speaking in the golf club because she's of that generation, right? She's in her mm-hmm. age now. I think she's still here. And anyway, we were talking about this in front of my daughter and laughing about the ignorance. And, and she was looking at us completely perplexed. Mm-hmm. Why? What? And we're going, yeah. oh, oh, she said, you can't have a black man in the car. And my daughter was just like, she didn't understand it. She didn't understand mm-hmm. it. She I didn't, know. And I didn't want to tell her because I didn't want her knowing how ignorant we used to be. And I just wanted her to stay in that innocence and why wouldn't a black man be allowed in the golf club? It was completely beyond her understanding. Oh, that's a good thing. Isn't that beautiful? You know, I'm, I'm happy when I hear stories I know. like that. And, and times have changed in the United States to, uh, except for the underbelly of the, the extreme right who uh, would like to put segregation back into to force, but it's really? not going to happen. Anyway, I remember having a talk with the beautiful Donna Lynn, who, do you know Donna? No, I don't. Oh, another contactee, abductee, contactee. And she was saying that after the fear came the love. So she wrote a book called From Fear to Love about oh. her experiences. And then she's, um, she remembered her soul planning time from her ET perspective and she said it was like a smorgasbord when she was looking at the earth experience and she was picking up all these things and putting them on her plate when she was saying yep I'll experience that and I'll experience that and she was saying that her guide was saying sure you haven't got too much on your plate because she's like death divorce disease (laughs) (laughs) and I'm thinking that Barney put a lot on his plate you know like he's kind of got segregate coming in as a black man married to a white woman in the 60s and then being an alien abductee oh my god he had piled it all on his plate (laughs) certainly had and you know he was uh, very dedicated to the civil rights movement he was appointed by the governor of the state of new hampshire to serve on the u.s commission on civil rights on the state advisory committee and uh, he had also received an award from Sergeant Shriver, who had been the head of the poverty program through the federal wow. government in Washington as well. Wow. And uh, for the work that he had done in a community organization in New Hampshire. So uh, he was just an, a wonderful person. Uh, I always hoped that I could marry a man just like Barney. Oh, really? Well, did you? <laughs> I did, finally. <laughs> well, he was definitely an advanced soul, right? He was an Yes, he was. Soul. He was an advanced soul. And isn't it interesting, maybe we could look at other people like Martin Luther King and other people that have been amazing advanced souls on this planet and see their extraterrestrial connections, you know? Like, uh-huh. That would have, be interesting. Have you ever seen Men in Black, the first Men in Black? It was something. Um, I tend not to watch movies, so I, I'm not sure if I did. They had a, inside the secret space program, they had this big board of all these um, personalities around the world. And it, this is in the first movie. And they say, you see all these people? They're all ETs. And there was like people <laughs> like Anthony Robbins, and, you know, political leaders. And, <laughs> and I'm thinking, hmm, that came out so many years ago and my daughter was <laughs> All right. Well, let's get let's get into oh, the Betty and Barney. It's well, I've learned a lot today, both from you and from them, about the whole experience that they've been through. I often mm-hmm. wondered, you know, who they were, why they were here, and definitely they started the conversation around the reality of extraterrestrial life in the universe because their experience was undeniable. It was, and and. It was the first scientifically investigated case of contact in the United States. And for one reason or another, there was a massive amount of physical and circumstantial evidence, Mm -hmm. more than in any other case. Mm -hmm. And you you have to ask, was this intentional? Mm -hmm. Or did they just make a lot of mistakes when they took Betty and Barney? 
onto the craft. Definitely intentional, I would say. Uh, interestingly enough, there is more evidential evidence in, the, in that time than there is now. Yes. I mean, there's a lot more psychic evidence, people who, you know, have memories and under hypnosis and everything, but there's a lot more evidential, like, I don't know, evidence. Like, maybe there isn't. Uh, maybe. Yes. Um, well, you know, they changed their program initially. They uh, took people from an external environment of when they were driving their cars or you know, sitting at night in their cars or hunting or fishing or camping. Uh, and then they changed their program when they had, as, as my understanding is, found those individuals whose line they wanted to follow, whose genetic line. Then they um, started taking them from their homes, their, their children, their grandchildren, and so on and so forth. Right. So, Kathleen, are you an experiencer? Yes. Can, can you share what you remember? I can. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> I just started to talk about this recently. I've been hiding it. For most of my life. Okay, you're out of the closet now. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm out of the closet, yes. But um, I think that the first time it occurred, or the first time I have conscious recall for it occurring, is when my Aunt Betty was working with a team of scientists who were giving her a script to go out onto her back porch to read every night in an attempt to send telepathic messages to these non-human entities to try to call them in to show their craft or to land in a certain area. Well, one of those long-term experiments that she was doing was to ask them to land on my grandparents' farm. I grew up across the street from my grandparents and one night, a craft did come in and land 250 feet from my childhood home. Uh, it was observed by two people coming in. It left physical trace evidence on the ground and on the trees. And my mother and I remembered finding ourselves on that craft. Wow. That's about all I remember. I remember lying on a table and having... Um, some individuals I knew there were two down by my feet. Uh, there were others that I was aware of, but I could never really see uh, what they looked like. And I was terrified because I didn't know what they looked like. And I had no indication of what kind of people they actually were. I had no indication that they were spiritual entities, that they cared. Later on, as I had experiences, they made me realize that I would be taken to craft um, periodically throughout my lifetime. And uh, I would get a little upgrade, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, became a little more psychic, a little more intuitive, uh, much more spiritual. Mm -hmm. than I had been. Uh, there were changes that took place in me over the years. And they would, I would be on the table and uh, I would feel a tingling sensation passing through my body. And it was a pleasant tingling. It wasn't harmful. And uh, they would tell me that uh, they were uh, attempting to uh, raise my vibrational frequency by doing this. Mm -hmm. They told me that they loved me. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't say it in words. Mm -hmm. It was past this very, very incredibly intense feeling of love projected toward me. Mm -hmm. And they would make me understand that we were all part of the same family. Yeah. So that was very, very nice. And uh, the, I immediately... Uh, stopped fearing them and stopped feeling that they were doing harm to me mm. when I realized that. So do you remember your agreement with them 
soul plan for a better word could use different words soul contract sacred contract <laughs> soul plan agreement well that was something else that i had to uh think about and i know that dolores cannon was uh speaking publicly about this that it was all part of a soul contract mm -hmm. and i said to my colleague who is also a hypnotherapist denise stoner i don't think that's true I don't remember making a soul contract. <laughs> well, we don't. And, really. and I want to prove that. So I said, please hypnotize me. Okay. And, and take me to the past life just before I came into this lifetime. And uh, because I want to know. And I, I want to prove that this isn't true. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, Denise did hypnotize me. And I said, I made a contract. I, I was a volunteer to come here to assist in the development of the human race. There you go. <laughs> that, so how long ago did that happen? Oh, my eyes is weeping. How long oh, ago? Several did... years ago when okay. Denise hypnotized me. So did that I, shock I you? Um, well, I think that it didn't come as a huge shock, but it was more of a test i hadn't believed it and then i said hmm dolores was correct <laughs> in this there you go there you yes go. oh wow fascinating just fascinating uh, how did that information change you it was after that that i decided to study under dolores mm -hmm. and to study her technique and it gave me the understanding that our perception of contact is colored by our emotional response to it if we are fearful if we have listened to those who have a negative spin on all of this and tell us that we are be ta being taken against our will that we are being mistreated abused um, that kind of thing then we will be fearful and we will take a more negative view of all of this and and it's been di so difficult for the people who are terrified about yeah. what's going on yeah. and you know just want to kill these ets or um, stop yeah. what's going on yeah. and uh, it's it's unfortunate that fear sells and people are making money by perpetrating this fearful story. Fear sells and fear is so contagious. Absolutely it is. contagious. I've been watching, I've been having a great old laugh though. I've been watching what people have been doing with this fear around the coronavirus. I don't watch, like you, I don't watch um, mainstream TV. I do watch the odd movie. But um, I didn't understand the whole toilet paper debacle that's happening in our city. I don't know if it's happening around the world. <laughs> some, doctor, some doctor got on television and said, the coronavirus is going to get you. You have to go stock up on essentials. And I think he mentioned toilet paper. And this has spread through the whole of Sydney. It's a, it's like, you know, we've got millions of people in Sydney. And all the supermarkets are out of toilet paper and rice and, you know, painkillers. And I don't know, people are panic buying. Anyway, there was this young man that's gone into a supermarket watching all these people fight each other over toilet paper, bash each other <laughs> up because they've got 16, you know, 10 packet rolls of toilet paper in their thing and they're not going to give away another one. And if somebody, it's like crazy what's happening. It's like, yes, it yeah, is crazy. It's crazy. I sort of look at these humans and this young boy is saying, why do you need the, so much toilet paper? And they're saying, I don't know. Well, why are you buying 16, 10 roll, packet rolls of toilet paper? I don't know. I just have to buy it. It's like they're hypnotized. Yes. They and know you know why, why they're buying it. Yeah. I spoke on the phone with my colleague, Denise Stoner, uh -huh. today. Uh -huh. And her husband had gone out to buy toilet paper. <laughs> so it's not just and, Australia. And, and we have Costco that here. And so he went to Costco where he could buy a large packet of toilet paper. And they usually have a large supply. Uh -huh. Well, when he arrived, there was one woman ahead of him and she had a shopping cart piled 15 feet high, probably. Well, it was probably an exaggeration, but very high. 
And and Ed said to her, um, you know, couldn't you just please let me have one of those uh, packages of toilet paper? My family and I really need it. <laughs> and she said, I have it. It's mine and you can't have it. I know, it's crazy. It's, it's yes. crazy. What's going on? Kathleen, I mean, what, I mean, what's going on in the minds of humanity? It, it, it is a form of hypnosis, isn't it? It's a form, like, what is happening? It's just... Fear controls people's fear. behaviour. Yeah. Yes. Fear. False mm -hmm. evidence appearing real. Yeah, it's just crazy. And, yeah, anyway, so we won't go. But my girlfriend posted, you know, on Facebook, which made me laugh. Honestly, it made me laugh so hard was nearly pissing my pants. I have survived the great toilet paper panic of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, fear. And whoever, they, we always talk about they, the authorities use fear like a weapon, don't they, to, mm -hmm. to dumb down humanity. And that's what they've done with the whole ET thing. And now that's the mm -hmm. coronavirus thing. Now it's the toilet paper debacle, the toilet paper panic of 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's get into okay. some of the some of the uh, things that you've learned. Obviously, not any names, but some of the things that's come out in your aggression sessions. What's been some of the most fascinating stories that you've heard through your QHHT regressions? Well, I find it fascinating that uh, when I regress individuals who have had contact, uh, I find that. In past lifetimes, either they were ETs mm -hmm. or they had contact with ETs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is uh, across the board, applies to everybody who has contact now. And it's like when they go to craft, it's like old home day. They, uh, they are very happy, but they don't remember when they, when they come back what happened. But they are just so happy. Uh, I've, I've recently been working with two women. This is a big case in the United States. And they were uh, paranormal investigators, very well known for their scientific approach at magazine articles published about their work. Spe they'd spoken at universities and conferences about their work. They had worked primarily uh, through the South uh, in battlefields uh, from the Civil War and on plantation sites, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they wanted to try an experiment. And that experiment was to meet with uh, experiencers of contact and to um, take all of their paranormal devices to attempt to record electronic voice phenomena mm -hmm. and to capture UFOs on video, on camera, that sort of thing. So I arranged for them to go to the home of a confirmed experiencer. Mm -hmm. So they, they go up there. They are standing in his yard at night. Uh, they have all of their equipment set up. And he says, look up there next to the moon. I think that's one coming in right now. And the next thing they know, all of their equipment is on the ground behind them. And they're kind of weaving and a little nauseated and don't know what has happened. Uh, they picked everything up, went into the experiencer's home, and his wife said, where, where did you go? Where have you been? I've been looking for you for a couple of hours now. Wow. And uh, initially, one of those paranormal investigators, they've let me uh, use their first names. So one is Ashley and one is Pam. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Ashley was okay. She didn't know what had happened, uh, but she felt okay with it. Pam, on the other hand, uh, had a great deal of difficulty and had uh, developed post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of what happened, about what she thought might have happened, I think. But 
uh, under separate hypnosis, and one does not know what the other one said at this point in my investigation, uh, but under hypnosis, Pam, who was the one who had post-traumatic stress disorder, had met with her human-looking ET family. And they told her that when she was growing up, all of the times that she thought she had seen ghosts in her house, it was them. Aww. When she woke up on the lawn outside her house when she was a girl, uh, after her family had been searching for her, it was them, that she was related to them, that they had known her through all lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And on this craft, she had a wonderful reunion with them mm -hmm. where they gave her information uh, about uh, their program, that they said that they had at one time lived on this planet, but uh, a very, very long time ago, there had been an environmental collapse, mm -hmm. that they had the means to move on, and they had gone, they had traveled through space, they found another planet in a binary star, star system that they had uh, settled on, that they now lived to be 800 Earth years, Mm -hmm. because they had uh, developed ways to do this. Mm -hmm. This group of four, two uh, kind of Caucasian-looking, six-foot-tall uh, humans, two men with long, light brown hair and large brown eyes, and two women who appeared to be, oh, in their late 20s, with the same type of hair and eyes, in, uh, but dressed differently. The women had on kind of beautiful iridescent, almost like mother of pearl, mm -hmm. uh, beautiful suits. The men were wearing kind of like blue body suits. Mm -hmm. And each man had a symbol on his chest, uh, like a chevron, like a V. And under the chevron of one were two lines indicating that he was sort of the one in charge. And um, they took her into their space where there was a beautiful panel on the wall. And it was almost like a plasma water wall, if you can imagine that, mm -hmm. with beautiful shades of blue. And then uh, she heard the, the craft kind of wind up, that it was getting ready to take off. And she could see green and she could see white. And they made her understand that there were many numbers inside that panel and it controlled the craft and uh, they didn't really have to control anything that uh, this was programmed the, the and the craft could jump through time and space and she felt that they had taken her to the moon okay and where they had kind of refueling she described the buildings on the moon that she saw that were uh, like uh, uh, translucent okay. uh, in, in different colors with almost like fluorescent tubes on the outsides of the buildings. They're, everything was beautiful. <laughs> it was amazing, well, I mean, to you, see the change in this you, woman. Yeah, as you describe it, I'm getting all these images. It's just, I can see it. It is beautiful. Like, I, I just have such a strong third eye that as people describe things I get this complete image of everything people talk about it's just amazing uh, yeah. it's just beautiful to see it uh, so how long ago did that happen to her this happened in 2015 so not uh, and, but I didn't hypnotize her until last April April right. of 2019 oh, I see. and just this month I hypnotized Ashley because the two had a falling out. Right. And uh, over this whole thing, I felt terrible and thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? I set up this experiment for them uh -huh. and this is what happened. And they were, they're both lovely women yeah. and uh, had worked together for a very long time, mm -hmm. had known one another since Ashley was seven years old oh. and Pam was a young adult. So... Uh, Ashley's experience was a little bit different than Pam's. 
Now, uh, the entities that she were, was with were kind of tan colored mm -hmm. uh, with white striation. They uh, had just a slit for a mouth, um, kind of large eyes, but not gigantic. Uh, they had a central rim or a ridge that ran down from like the lower forehead down to where the human nose would be, um, maybe a little lower than that, and the mouth was set lower on the face. Mm -hmm. But she loved these entities, and they were her family. And they took her. Um, now they explained that uh, for her, she had to lie down on a table, and she was taken to a dome-shaped room with several tables in it. Now, Pam was also taken to a dome-shaped room, um, but she didn't remember having to lie down on the table where a uh, kind of a, a semi-circular uh, kind of blue uh, something formed. It wasn't solid, and it, but it was protective. An energy it was something that she had to be in uh -huh. to protect the human body for space travel okay. because they, she was told the human body did not fare well in, with space travel. Um, so she too uh, described being taken to the moon mm -hmm. uh, and uh, described a building just like the one that Pam had described. And uh, she was taken inside that building where uh, she met others of that kind and uh, received information and also the memory of her life as one of them and oh, wow. uh, how and her best friend uh, was there and uh, just laughed and laughed about the sense of humor that her best friend had so they seem to be kind of an insectoid type of entity. What did they call them? Like, what did they, I guess we can only give them a human name. Uh, no, we all, they didn't uh, refer to themselves, I don't think, by a particular name. I could be wrong. I would have to check my notes, which obviously we can't do right now. Um, and, uh, but it ended up being a very nice experience for both women. Now, uh, Ashley is wondering if the one that uh, had been her friend in a previous lifetime came home with her. Because since that experience, uh, she has had a landing site on her, in her yard, uh, where apparently something round set down. Uh, she uh, woke up and saw two of these entities at the foot of her bed and um, she doesn't know if she was taken to craft we didn't go there but she remembered that experience and uh, there she does have video of something that i call the magic carpet because it's a kind of cloud white like but it's like a carpet in a way too it's kind of flat and uh uh, she took one uh, video camera photo of this with a light, like a, a beam of light. It wasn't a skylight or something, just a beam of light coming down through it. And there it was. And so uh, she senses that this is maybe her friend from her previous lifetime. Wow. Wow. So were the two women on the same ship or were they on different ships? I guess. Well, that's a question that I have. And they're going to come to my home again in a couple okay. of months. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get all of this sorted out. Okay. And also the video and the EVPs because they do have voice phenomena of these non-humans and some communication. And also they have um, motion activated camera infrared video of these non-humans that Ashley interacted with. Wow. 
very amazing to actually have photographic evidence. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so two women having the same experience at the same time, one remembers it with fear and terrified and one remembers it with love. Yes. They, they separate because they have different opinions or different perspectives of uh, a similar experience. And now mm-hmm. through the quantum healing technique, through your therapy, they've come to a better understanding of what happened. Have they, um, you know, resumed their friendship? And They are speaking. Yeah. Yes. Thank goodness. They're speaking again. They're sorting through this. They were a wonderful investigative team. Yeah. Very scientific, very dedicated to what they were doing, and both lovely people yeah. too. And uh, I'm so pleased that they are once again speaking to one another. And when they come down, I'm thinking about hypnotizing both of them and putting them in that moment where this occurred. Uh, I want to know if they were taken to the same craft, if they were taken to different craft. Right. Right. But they both went to the moon. Interesting. And they both yes. saw the same building. Yes. So that, that's, that's fascinating, isn't it? Mm-hmm. How has this uh, remembering of this information changed their life since then? So that happened quite recently, right? The, the sessions with you. Yes. Um, uh, Pam has uh, managed to go on with her life. You know, a quantum healing hypnosis has that quantum healing component. Right. And part of the reason I believe that Pam was in such distress is that after her experience, she developed rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis. Wow. And she became wow. disabled. Wow. But in the quantum healing hypnosis session, we asked her higher self for healing. Uh And she was healed. Beautiful. And, you know, so she feels a lot better about that. And she has told me that just recently uh, she has had uh, some of this arthritic pain coming back on her. But when she listens to the healing session on the quantum healing hypnosis uh, audio that I made for her, the... uh, the pain goes away. Mm. And so she's maintaining her health, her good health by doing this. So she's able to go out into the community. She's able to clean her house by herself. Now, this is a a well-educated woman. She uh, worked at a university. Uh, She had a master's degree. She uh, ran the Uh, a portion of the medical research that was being done at that university. She was in charge of all of the theses on their medical research. So she had a very important job uh, as well. And imagine the impact that it had on her to become disabled and to have to leave her job. So I'm, you know, I'm very pleased that this has worked out for her that she can go on now with her life and, and hopefully she and Ashley will go on together. Well, as you were talking about her um, developing the um, arthritis, was it arthritis after the experience? Um, Barney p- piped in <laughs> and yes. says, this is what happened to me. He said, this is uh, the power of your thoughts. Mm-hmm. Humans need to understand the power of their thoughts. Uh, to create, not just to create what they want, but to create what they don't want. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that that fear, that gripping fear that you hang on to uh, definitely has impact on your physical body. It absolutely does. It absolutely does, yeah. And during the the time when I was very fearful myself, Mm -hmm. I ended up developing chronic fatigue and immune dysfunction syndrome, and I became disabled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't until I spoke with uh, an experiencer who has positive contact uh, and uh, allowed me to speak via Skype with um, this non-human entity that he communicates with, and I asked for healing that these non-human entities came into my home, took me to some environment, um, 
I remembered lying on a table. There were two up by my head. They were taller than my usual grays, mm -hmm. and a gray type. They, they're not the little grays. Um, and they, they seemed to glow. And I, I could see a screen. I could see the outline of my body. And I could see what looked like energy going through my body. I was feeling that tingling sensation, again, that I feel when they say they're attempting to uh, raise my vibrational frequency. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could also see some of my organs uh, highlighted in different colors, pastel colors. Wow. And when I underwent this experience, I was healed completely. And I did not have a relapse. I haven't had a relapse yet. Oh, that's so beautiful. Uh, a million questions going through my head and they're just saying now, and, they're, and I'm speaking to a collective now, mm -hmm. um, this, is, this, 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 this technology is available to you humans now, here on earth, here now on earth. It's available. You don't have to be abducted and go to a ship, they're saying. <laughs> I wish that it would be accessible to us, but uh, saying you know, it is. It, it, in a capitalistic saying. society, you have the individuals who have the greatest amount of money, who uh, uh, have a vested interest in, in retaining the that money and using chemotherapy and using um, oh, yeah. you know, techniques that uh, are harmful to the human body rather than using the uh, techniques, the, the medical programs that have been set up uh, by these non-human entities. And I know that you had Kevin Briggs on your yeah. show. Yeah. Kevin lives in the same town that I live in, in okay. Florida. He's a friend of mine. Yeah. And in communication with the non-human entities uh, that Kevin communicates with, they told us that they had given that information to scientists in the United States and that it was rejected. Oh, really? Well, yes. what they're saying is they're saying that there are many people across the planet that have this information, but they're not in the scientific mainstream allopathic oh. community. They're healers, they're psychics, they're sound healers, they're saying. A lot uh -huh. of sound healing um, is using the same technology because it's all sound and light. Uh, yep, they're saying that, you know, through the John of God, uh, that the, they had these light beds that many of my friends who practice healing have, and they're different colors and they shine different lights on in your, in your chakras, that light healing. Uh -huh. So uh, they're saying that's a rudimentary, a rudimentary experience of it. I've been on the light beds many times, but yeah, this technology has been given to humanity. Uh, it, it, and it is around the planet in different forms. It's just not mm -hmm. in our mainstream. It's just not in the allopathic, you know, like our doctors just have not got a clue. <laughs> sorry. Uh -huh. sorry. Yeah. They, just don't. they just don't. To mm -hmm. to the ET race, healing the human form is so easy. So easy. But then they say that um, as humans, we have to take responsibility for how we're flowing our energy, how we're thinking and feeling. So again, eliminating fear and and eliminating limiting thought forms is really our responsibility on mass at this time on Earth. And when we learn to clean up our thoughts, then yeah, healing becomes really easy. Mm -hmm. Really easy. Yeah. I know that is true because when a truth comes from someone, I feel a tingling sensation in my crown chakra and my third eye chakra, and I'm tingling like crazy now. <laughs> You're buzzing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, I like a bit of a buzz. Um, oh, so fascinating. I've kind of gone a bit blank. I space out when you talk. I get sort of very expansive and I lose my thoughts. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a beautiful feeling, but it's the logic mind sort of has to kick in again. Uh, yeah, you hold a very expansive energy, a very, when you talk, a very expansive energy. Well, that, uh, that's beautiful. So it was given to scientists and it was rejected. Well, the, mm -hmm. science, the science might have rejected it, but the healers haven't. You know, in the yeah. books, The Law of One, um, they talk about the wanderers. Um, a different name has been light workers, light weavers, uh, being these highly evolved 
ET intelligences, you could say, but but intelligences or consciousnesses that have that have predominantly been living in other dimensions or in other, on other planets. And I think that when the do you know the the law of one information? It was channeled through. Um, I, can't, I can't remember. It was three people that were involved, and it was channeled through a woman in the sixties or seventies. Anyway, they were saying, I think it was 71, that at that time there were 60 million wanderers on earth at that time, Mm. 1971. So these are these, you know, ET souls like you, like Betty and Barney Hill, like your friends, I suspect like me, like many of us where these these, uh, uh, souls that are here on earth to shift the consciousness and humanity. Imagine how many of them are here now. That if 60 million yes. were there in 1971, it'd be mm-hmm. fascinating, wouldn't it? Mm. Yes. Yeah. So anything else you'd like to say before? How long have we been talking? Been yakking for about an hour and a half. Um, about an hour and 15 minutes. Found if, uh, found if, um, I have an important message to share regarding contact with non-human intelligence. I guess you've shared that important message. Uh, Is there another message you have? I do have a message for experiencers, Mm -hmm. for anyone who is fearful. I don't know if there is anyone listening to your show who uh, is having that experience, but uh, the Mutual UFO Network has uh, chapters around the world. And I am the director of MUFON's Experiencer Research Team. Uh, We are primarily a support team of specialists, and I set this up in 2011. It has expanded over the years. We now have 32 uh, caring, compassionate individuals on the team, and then we have five mental health uh, practitioners who uh, work as consultants to our team. Uh, anyone who has any concerns, who wants to talk to a person uh, who will be non-judgmental and supportive can go to mufon.com, mufon.com, scroll down to the experiencer research team, uh, speak with someone, and uh, click on that. It will take them to Uh, the next page, which at the top of the page says uh, the experiencer questionnaire. Uh, Click on that, complete the, it's only a 30 question questionnaire, just an uh, icebreaker. Don't worry what your score is. A lot of people say, oh, I didn't score 30 points. I'm not an experiencer. You all believe me, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. Because if you score 15 points, you're very solidly there, indicating that you have had more than one experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, don't worry about the score. It's an icebreaker so that you can just speak with someone uh, who will help you. Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, my team, three members of my team and I, three friends, I wrote most of this book, but uh, this is the book extraterrestrial contact, Mm -hmm. what to do when you've been abducted. And it is a book that we wrote specifically to help individuals who are having these experiences and also also for those who love people Mm -hmm. who are having these experiences, those who want to know more about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, an important message that I wanted to carry around the world to people because I know that not everyone is as enlightened and and feeling as spiritual about this as you and I. And uh, so we're doing what we can to assist others. Kathleen, do you think a lot of the mental health issues that we have specifically in our younger generation is connected to this? I don't know. I can't answer that question oh, well I, i'm going to answer it i do i was okay. listening to uh lady gaga and oprah so oprah's uh-huh. doing some series where she's cruising around or she's got some series she's interviewing all these very famous people as oprah likes to do 
I only listen to the one. I don't know. I click on these things. I never know why I'm clicking on it. Just like I was watching the horror movie the other night. My daughter's like, why are you watching that? I'm like, I don't know. It was, <laughs> it was preparing me for this conversation, funnily enough. Um, uh, yes. So she's speaking to Lady Gaga and Lady Gaga, you know who she is, obviously. Oh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Very open in talking about her mental health issues and how she's been in chronic pain fibroneuralgia for over five years and um, she's on a slew of drugs she talks about how she she loves the drugs you know like she's just like she's saying that she's a real advocate for the drug taking because it's helped her feel more sane and less in pain mm -hmm. but I'm listening to her thinking there's more to this story than you know you know like there's so much more to this story than she she knows she started meditating she started her spiritual path in earnest because she mm -hmm. was on this rock star path but she did come out and say that you know she was repeatedly raped at 19 so she carries a lot of trauma but um she's had a lot of therapy in, mm -hmm. in the allopathic in the mainstream sort of psychology and and she does meditate but she's still in this chronic pain and i wonder you know i really wonder about people that are in chronic pain if if it's this you know i i feel like pain points towards a truth that we can't look at and um mm -hmm. i had a woman on the show michaela sheldon who was in chronic pain till she started meditating and then she started channeling all the galactic collectives and when she started channeling all the pain went away so it was this mm -hmm it was this indicator that there's something else for you to do here. You know, it might not just be about being rich and famous or, or being, she was a soccer mom and she was like one of these, um, you know, real sort of a type personalities doing everything for everybody, feeding every, doing everything. And then she had to mm -hmm. stop and meditate and now she's out there mm -hmm. changing the world. And uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but I, I sense that maybe she's holding anger in Gaga anger of what happened oh i'm sure she is when she was young and yeah, and you yeah. have to let go of that anger you have to move on in a proactive manner yeah. and if you if you lock yourself into the, this feeling of anger and resentment uh you will not move on you and yeah. you will hold that pain oh, yeah. inside i guess that mainstream psychology is not into forgiveness you know it's into understanding why you feel sad but it doesn't tell you to go and forgive the person that did it to you i don't think that's a mainstream psychological technique is it which is maybe what she needs to do yes and a lot of what they do recommend here is that uh, you publish that person's name in the newspaper or you publicly accuse that person uh, to get back at them to yeah make them accept what they have done yeah, but i don't right. think that it's emotionally healthy no that's not going to make your pain go away i mean obviously her emotional pains turned into this physical pain look i i applaud her for being so public about it because here she mm -hmm. is this mega famous rock star who's really mm -hmm. helping people look at their pain in a different way um so yes. she's doing her job it's just sad that she has to be on this she calls it her rattle because she's got so many drugs you know she's got a little box and it rattles and she's on all these drugs but she doesn't need to be yeah it just <laughs> takes a bit of forgiveness and a bit of that therapy that we're talking about maybe some qhht would fix it for her anyway it might it might, might help her a lot she might come out in a couple of years and say i'm an et <laughs> <laughs> that be amazing? okay just before we go what do you think about you know kevin came on the show a couple of times and the second time was to reveal the date that his guides his mob his team said we're gonna make ourselves known and it didn't happen i, I didn't feel like it was gonna happen i've got to say it just not because it wasn't what they told kevin it was just that i just didn't think that the authorities that they were speaking to were not ready to come out mm. not that humanity is not ready just the authorities are not ready yes. what do you think about disclosure and what do you what's your thoughts about all this when when will this be more public i think that disclosure is happening very slowly mm -hmm. here in the united states on september um, december 16 2017 
the front page of the New York Times carried an article about the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program that was run out of the Pentagon for several years. It was a secret program. And what it did was initially it investigated the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, excuse me, in Utah, uh, where there is UFO and paranormal activity and portals and, and prehistoric animals, all sorts of things going on there. And then uh, it also uh, had a scientific analysis of uh, video, of radar video, the most advanced radar in the world, they claim. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has been shown to the American public. It's probably been shown around the world, maybe. Has it, has it in Australia? Well, it might have. Um, when you say shown, shown on our mainstream news outlets or shown on YouTube? I don't watch uh, mainstream it's, news Well, outlets, so. we've had both in the United States. Okay. But look at my it, I know it's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So anyone who wanted to look could just look for the Tic Tac video. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Navy has now acknowledged that it was their film. It is their film. Mm -hmm. They do not acknowledge that they have released it. And uh, naval officers have stepped forward uh, to say that this is not our technology. They do not believe that this is technology from any country on this planet because the technology that they use is such that it would uh, kill a person mm -hmm. uh, the, to move uh, so quickly and at such abrupt angles. Uh, we know that it can uh, hover at 80,000 feet for hours. It can drop down to just above the ocean and cause a swirling kind of boiling sensation in the water. We know that uh, there was another craft like it that came up and seemed to meet with it and communicate with it as it was hovering over the water. And then it rose vertically into the sky again. There have been three different types that have been observed by naval officers and captured on radar. And this is uh, coming out slowly. I think that the government is gauging the public's reaction. Mm -hmm. And they're not quite ready to talk about what is flying around inside the craft. Um, so, yeah. uh, you know, they, uh, that's what I'm saying is not officially approved, I'm sure, when I'm talking about extraterrestrials. But, uh, you know, at least, at least after a 70 year cover up and denial, and um, official uh, sort of statements being made by disinformants that would ruin people's reputations, their lives, mm -hmm. cause them to lose their jobs, cause fear of even speaking about this. Yeah. People are beginning to talk more in the United States, yeah. um, particularly about sightings they've had. Mm -hmm. And how do you think it'll change humanity when? when this uh, realization that we're not alone is is on mass like not just in you know groups like yours or mine or other you know MUFON conferences and stuff I mean you know Mary was saying that she spoke at some UFO conferences over 5,000 people there so it's you know there's a lot yeah. of people talking about this but um, yes I have as well yeah mm -hmm. but but more <sighs> more on mass. How do you think it'll change human society? It depends upon the spin that the leaders of this world put on it. If they consider it to be a threat, if they view it as uh, an invasion, if uh, the, there is a great uh, surge of fear that is promoted in individuals, it won't go well. But if uh, the truth is told, and we are made aware that these non-humans are here to assist in our development, uh, 
that they are not going to harm us, that they have been here for thousands of years, and that they come back periodically to assist in our development, and that they are concerned about human behavior. Dating back to 1954, in the research and investigation that I have done, and I'm not reading other people's books, this is, I do research myself, and I was able to acquire the files, um, the correspondence files of a Navy admiral in the United States and a Canadian government official mm -hmm. who were working with a woman who was communicating with these non-humans. Mm -hmm. Dating back to 1954, these non-human entities stated that they would be happy to help us, to educate us, to assist us, but no nation would be favored over any other nation. Perfect. Their largest two concerns were our use of nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. of nuclear energy, mm -hmm. that uh, if there is a thermonuclear explosion, uh, it will go out into all of the different dimensions. Mm -hmm. That is one major concern. Mm -hmm. The other major concern is our failure as humans to be good stewards to our planet mm -hmm. and the fear of environmental collapse as a result of human activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I hope and pray that we reach a point where that message can reach the population of Earth. Mm. Uh, people have been uh, contacted dating back into the 50s, have been asked to pass that message on, uh, and it has been suppressed mm. by government authorities. And those people have been made to look like kooks, like lunatics, mm -hmm. like people who are seeking attention, who are attempting just to make money off from all of this. I mean, it's the the spin that they have put yeah. on it for a very yeah. long time is unfortunate. I know. My, my, my daughter did a personal growth course recently, which has greatly helped her see some of her own stuff. And uh -huh. um, But she still said to me, we're having this lovely conversation, but I still want you to stop talking about all that alien stuff, mum. <laughs> <laughs> It still freaks her out. And I don't think it's because she doesn't believe it. I just think it's because she wants to feel like she fits in and she doesn't want to, you know, like talk about like her, she got this crazy mum talking about aliens. <laughs> you know, it's this sort of like I want to fit in type thing. Yeah, so you she, see it's still a, a public per perception. Perspective, yes, it is. It is, which is amazing because she hangs out with all these incredibly conscious, you know, little hippies. They, they drum and they meditate and they dance and they do all this stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But they're not really having, you know, not all of them. Some, some, most of them are not really having this kind of ET alien conversation. It's just the perspective that we've been given that it's mm -hmm. so uh, crazy. Uh, it's a yeah. collective hypnosis. It's a collective perspective. But what they were saying to me during what you were saying is they said, you have to remember a critical mass. And then they said, um, just like you stated that in the early 70s, there were 60 million wanderers on the planet. There is a lot more now. And they're saying that if it does come out as mass um, uh, awareness through media systems, that all those wanderers that are on the planet will have an instant memory and like wake up, you know, even, even my daughter might go, Oh, it's not so stupid anymore. And I'm a part of this, you know, like she might have this sort of instant remembering. And she yeah. said, and they said, uh, when enough people hold that consciousness, just, and then they're saying, just like the crazy consciousness of the toilet paper, it will just, explode in the mind of collective consciousness humanity mm -hmm. um yes. so it takes critical mass enough people have to believe something for everyone to believe it yes. so in the past critical mass has been used in the opposite so they've instilled fear and that critical mass has worked but they said that the op it can it will change so, what the non-humans told me is that initially they went to uh, officials around the world and that these officials would, did not want to listen to them at all. Mm -hmm. So they started out with the people. 
-hmm. And they said that uh, eventually there will be a critical mass where more than half of the planet knows of their presence and then there will be no denial. Exactly, yeah. Oh, look, not even half. I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've chatted with my mob about critical mass before and they said, you know, for something to explode in the minds of humanity, it only takes less than 5% of the whole population. And mm -hmm. I said, oh, which seemed like a small, but then when you add up 5% of 7.5 billion people, it's actually a lot of people, but, mm -hmm. um, but it, doesn't take, it doesn't take 50%. It only takes less than five is what I've been told. But they mm -hmm. explain critical mass as in, you know, the fashion they said, you know, enough people agree that this fashion looks good and then the rest of the world starts agreeing and it only takes a very small percent. It's amazing how critical mass works, actually. People call it the hundredth monkey effect, but um, yeah, it is amazing how it works. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So, so not long, not, not, not far. It'll happen in our lifetime, don't you think, Kathleen? Well, I'm older than you. I hope it will happen in my <laughs> lifetime. Not by much. A couple of days. <laughs> oh. I was 13 in 1961. Oh, so yeah, yeah. Figure it out. Yeah. A couple of yes, days. Couple but, of you know, I, I know that they're here. I know who they are. Um, I, and it's been a good life. Yeah, <laughs> and like, it's been a good it, life. It will happen eventually. It will. Absolutely. And it sounds like the work that you're doing is really amazing. So if people, do you do your sessions online or only in person? Only in only person. In person. Yeah. It's very, very important when you're working with someone who uh, might experience some level of trauma yeah. mm -hmm. to do it in person. It's mm -hmm. considered unethical to do it online. Oh, okay. So obviously you're in Florida. Yes. And um, people can reach you at Kathleen, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N dash Marden, M-A-R-D-E-N dot com. That's correct. For people who are listening on audio. Thank you again. Thank you so much for being on the show. It's just been fascinating. fascinating. Oh, it's such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for I'm having sure me you're on. full of so many more stories from your clients, some amazing stories. I mean, Sev's... Yes. Seb Tok's story of seeing all the hybrids, like just all these millions and millions and millions of these bodies was amazing. You know, her experience mm -hmm. was amazing. We chatted about that on the show. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going there on. Is. Mm. Thanks again, Kathleen. Okay, thank you so much. Wow. Lovely talking with Kathleen Martin. Just such a beautiful lady, such a beautiful lady. Uh, yes, we had a small chat afterwards and yeah, I was saying to her that every time I'd heard the Betty and Barney Hill story, it, there'd always been so much mystery and shrouded and fear around the whole story. Uh, yeah, and uh, I hope that we brought a more positive perspective. And she was saying that um, Betty had actually said to her that she had a memory of the ET saying, you know, I hope that you weren't too frightened. I hope we didn't hurt you. And, and Betty said, oh, no, no. Do you want to come in for a cup of tea or something like that? She invited, she invited them back to her house. And they said, no, it's all right. It's okay. I don't think that they can hang out in this environment. I often think about this. You know, the bacteria and the environment that we live in as souls in human bodies is so different to the physical environments they live in. And... Um, you know, we talk about disclosure and us all living together, but I wonder, uh, things have to change. Um, the different bodies have different, uh, have different requirements, not just oxygen. We often see when we listen to shows like Lost in Space or all sorts of shows around um, going to different planets, what are all those television shows, Star Wars and everything, that, um, you know, they land on a planet and they have to see if they, they can breathe the air, but it's not just the air and the oxygen that's required for different life forms to exist. There's a whole lot of other chemical components. So anyway, it will be interesting to see how that all works. But what fascinated me was um, the energy field around the body that when they were traveling in the craft, she said there was like a blue dome, like an energy field, because human bodies don't travel well in space. And uh, I was thinking, oh yeah, so this energy field has created an environment 
like a gravity environment and an environment for the physical human body to be able to sustain the type of travel that the ship was going through, which must be, I don't know how they travel, like it's going through portals, dimensions, traveling through time and space. Anyway, that was fascinating, always fascinating to talk to people, talk about this stuff. And um, she was saying that Kevin is still optimistic uh, about disclosure. He was given that date, the 2nd of February, if people watch the show. And the ETs came back to him and gave him the message that the UN, that the authorities in the UN rejected it and they weren't ready to have that conversation publicly. And that's why it didn't happen. But it'll happen one day. We don't know when. One day. Maybe in a couple more years. A few more years. A couple of days. Anyway, interesting. Wasn't that fascinating? She's such a lovely lady. Okay, what else have I got to say to you? <laughs> lots, lots to say. I need to do some lots going on. I need to do some, um, some teaching seminars because there's just so much going on in the minds of the collective, especially around fear. Not just fear of coronavirus fear, but uh, uh, fear of other people's opinions, fear of what people think. You know, I'm just seeing a lot of this. I think that as the light bands are hitting the planet, it's like dredging up all our fears. And so there's a lot of fear that's very exposed at the moment, uh, not just in Sydney. I didn't realise that the toilet paper debacle was a global phenomenon. Uh, fascinates me. It's all part of this fear being dredged up. And uh, fear can be very um, illogical. It can make us do crazy things like buying reams and reams and reams of toilet paper and not sharing it with people that genuinely need some toilet paper. It's like, I've got no toilet paper at home. Could I have one of those? No, I need all this. It's, it's crazy how fear can make us, um, can make us crazy. You know, Byron Katie says that when you believe your stressful thoughts, you are insane. <laughs> and it just looks like people are believing this, their stressful thoughts and everyone's kind of gone a bit insane. But it's all part of the shift in consciousness and how we're um, being forced to look at what we're holding inside us. So if you're going through a hard time at the moment, it's not what's happening to you that's torturing you. It's how you're perceiving it, how you're responding to it how you're responding to the thoughts within you, the belief, the thought forms inside you. They're coming up. Uh, are you going to believe them? Are you going to react according to your fears? Or you, are you going to witness them? Just like just sit back and witness it and say, oh, I'm really upset about that or I'm really fearful about that or that's really pissing me off. And like take yourself out of the emotion and witness it and then ask yourself, what belief am I holding for me to really feel like this yeah that's how we uh that's how we can process our fears or limiting beliefs on a moment to moment ba basis as they arise rather than get swept away and rea and reactionary because of what we're feeling step back and witness them and say what's causing this what's causing this fear in me or what's causing this panic or what's causing this upset or emotion in me what belief am I holding and believe you me they might not be personal beliefs it might be beliefs that we've been uh, conditioned through our media system to be fearful about things and uh, the coronavirus is doing its job in having us look at our fears around health I think in one of the shows I had on recently we spoke about how there's so much fear around health whenever we get a pain we've been so indoctrinated into thinking that we're all going to die of cancer. How many times is it on the news that people are dying in droves of cancer? So if we get a pain here or a pain there, we're all like, oh, it might be cancer. We run off to the doctor and have a million tests. I've done it. I've done it a few times. I've, I've bought into the fear and run off to the doctor and had a, a slew of tests and I'm not dying of cancer, even though every person in my family died of cancer, everyone. So I'm like your classic, you're going to, you know, get cancer because it's in my, all my family history. But love trumps all of it. I use that word trump. But really love can heal anything. Love trumps the lot. So if you let go of your fear, let go of your pain, emotional pain, and return to love, whether you stay on the planet or leave, you'll have health and joy 
and love while you're here. Because death is not the failure to heal. Death is just a death is just a decision to return home. Just a decision to return home. Sometimes we've had enough and we just exit the matrix. And uh, yeah, but we can return to love without exiting the matrix. We can return to love right here, right now. Thank you all again for watching and listening to the shows and uh, who's coming up? I don't know. There's a whole slew of people coming up. A bit excited about talking to a few of them. Who's coming up next week? Mike? Hmm. There's a few people I've booked in. I've forgotten, I've forgotten what they're... I have to have go back and have a look at what, what, why I've booked them in. I know Paul Selleck's coming up. He's coming up in a couple of weeks. I've had him on the show before. He's channeling amazing things. Kenneth, I can't remember who Kenneth is. Oh dear, David Rippey. Oh, he's got an amazing story. There's quite a few people coming up that have not get any shows or any interviews on YouTube and they, they have amazing stories, which will be beautiful. Aaron Abke is coming on the show, who I'm a bit in love with at the moment as a spiritual teacher. And Pierre and Cullen, the Palladian Collective, amazing channeling, they're coming up. Oh, Nick, who's that? Oh, Janine Shepherd's coming back. Oh, there's a few people I have to look up. And Janine I had on the show in 2012. And when I say on the show, she was on um, when I was on community radio. She has an amazing story and she's a beautiful person. We became instant best friends. She's living in the States now. She is an Australian. She was um, an Olympic champion and hit by a car and completely paralyzed and was in a body cast and didn't let that stop her, learnt to fly, she's written a whole lot of books so she talks about overcoming trauma and she's amazing and incredibly spiritual too. I love Janine, she's coming up and um, Zoe's going to come back and talk to us. Oh look, there's quite a few people coming up. And we had um, Peter Panamore, P Peter Panagore in the Inner Sanctum uh, last weekend and Zane Daniels is coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, it was lovely talking with Peter. It, the, the conversation was very interactive and it got very heated. We were talking about spirituality and religion and the church, um, the fundamentalism of the church, fundamentalism versus mysticism. We talked a lot about mysticism and oh, it was a really great, fabulous conversation with Peter. Yeah, it was wonderful. So if you want to join our little tribe and have wonderful conversations with us and uh, learn about all sorts of things, please join our Inner Sanctum. And as always, remember to buy the book, Awakened by Death. It's a beautiful book to read. Thanks again for watching. Love you all. Bye.